And I want to introduce, to make the introduction to Amir Alakani and uh, Joey Muniz. So Joey happens to be a DJ as well, too. And uh, Amir has been, gee, it takes, he seems like forever. So the last time you were going to, the last time uh, you, you, you were invited, uh, apparently you had to take the early flight home to the Philippines because of some, some things happened and you don't want to know. Okay, so without much ado, Joey Muniz, Amir Alakani. Thanks. Thanks, Ming. All right. How you guys doing? Sunday. Woo! Yeah? All right. Uh, first off, um, I've been to DEF CON forever, and this is actually our fourth time speaking for this event, but I've never brought my daughter. So you can see I have the earmuffs on because we do use foul language at times, but this time we may not. So hopefully, hey. Oh, she can hear us. Uh, all right. She can hear us. We have to be careful with the, the language, but there will be an earmuff warning for this particular talk because of that. The other warning is, uh, unfortunately, Amir and I work for big companies, and uh, our, our HR departments got a hold of our talks before this, and because high YouTube and the recording of this, we had to cut off a little bit of the video we're going to show. Uh, it may be posted later on our blogs, but we want to apologize up front. Uh, we got censored by our HR people because we like our jobs, and uh, some stuff we're going to talk about now is not necessarily legal. It's, uh, not, it's not hypothetically legal, right? This is all in our minds or something yeah. like that. We'll be using the term magic land. So when we say something happened in magic land, we're not admitting guilt to what we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, basically, the subject is, if you didn't see it on the talk, it's uh, fishing for fishers. The empire, em, enterprise strikes back. And the idea is we're going to talk about fishing, which... We've all hopefully have heard of phishing. Uh, even Raylan's heard of phishing. Uh, we're going to talk about what you can do from a legal perspective to defend against it. And then we're going to flip to the dark side and talk about, well, what else can you do? How can you actually hack back? Which is essentially not really legal. Um, basically, as we said, it's been four other talks that we've done. You can check out our other talks on YouTube. We've uh, done a, a ton. But let's first introduce ourselves. Amir? All right. So. Uh First of all, I look much better in a suit, so I decided to put that picture up there. But um, my name is Amir, Amir Lakani. I'm actually a researcher, malware uh, reverse engineer, and uh, I do stuff in forensics. I run the Doctor Chaos blog. If any of you guys have heard of that, uh, but um, yeah, it's me. I'm I'm a hacker. That's kind of what I do, and a whole bunch of other BS, I guess. And then um, Joey, work for Cisco. I'm an architect. I have the security blogger. Again, on our blogs, either Dr. Chaos and or security blogger, we'll show the rest of this hopefully later. We just were told not to do it right now. Um, together, we've written four different, well, three different books in one video class, and then we've also done books independently. Our latest book is uh, investigating, uh, it's basically forensics for a network engineer. And uh, part of that book, we'll talk today about like honeypots and how to create one, how to create a cuckoo honeypot. Uh, there'll be some details that we're going to leave out because it's just a long subject, but a lot of those answers can be found also in the book. So that's who we are. And let's get into the talk. So fishing. We've all, I've I likely seen phishing. As you probably know, it's not just email. A lot of times it's email, it could be phone calls, it could be text messages. Uh, this is the classic uh, PayPal fish. This one I actually I got over the phone. I don't know if this year if you guys experienced this in the USA, but I had this spooky robot voice call me saying that I owe the IRS a bunch of money. And then when you call back, the, basically the scam is that either I can wire them the money now and not go to court or I'm going to be forced to go to court. Uh, but that's a very popular one. And a lot of times that's the case. The phishing attacks, they're, they're timing it based on certain things. So uh, at Cisco, I'll tell you now, or the, if you want to fish us, the easiest one is the UPS fake email because basically it's Christmas time. You don't know if your husband or wife got you something. You're like, oh, what is this? And you just click it. Uh, so that's typically the most effective one for us when we fish ourselves is the UPS one. Good news, though, is a lot of the vendors that provide email and, and communication are aware of phishing, and they have this thing called reputation security where you'll get the flag that says, this email has been seen a bunch of times. It's probably not real. So at least like the vendors themselves are offering you know, some, something for you, but still it's not enough. 
So the 101 on phishing, and again, we're going to start with what is phishing, go into legal, then illegal. Uh, the 101 is first the training. And if you see English, basically, most likely somebody is using a translator. You're going to find later in our talk, I mean, there's call centers dedicated to doing this in other countries, and they don't understand the native language. They just use translators. I've personally been busted uh, on like Russian sites using translators, and they're like, you're not speaking proper Russian. You're using a translator. So uh, broken language is one. Other things to look for, uh, public data. And this actually goes back to our talk that you didn't show up for because you had to go to the Philippines, you a-hole. But uh, we were supposed to talk, I did it myself. But long story short, we did a, a social engineering attack and uh, it was based on a fake account. And a lot of the data we were using was all based on LinkedIn and Facebook. So rereading what's already public against you. So know what's public against you is the second concept. Yeah, you know, you know. You know, on this one, I just uh, was talking about inf using information against you. I remember when you were on Facebook and we connected with one, one guy and he's like, hey, I don't really trust you. Remember that? And you're like, like hey, I, you just looked up his common friend and saw that he was in New York and said, I, I ran into Matt in New York in like two seconds and the guy's like, oh, cool. You know, Matt, I guess I trust you now. Yeah, so the story on that one was 10 years ago, you can see the guy's like job history and 10 years ago it said he worked at Hungry Howie's Pizza. So then I said, oh yeah, I was, and we were, by the way, we were a blonde hot girl named Emily Williams. But I was like, yeah, I was uh, uh, Derek. I was Derek's girlfriend. And you see Derek, uh, current location, New York City. So I was like, yeah, uh, I ran into New York, Derek in New York City and we were talking about you. So again, just the idea is you can look at people's public records or Facebook records, basically read it against them, especially it's five or ten years old. They're not going to know like and remember all their friends of friends type people and just play that role. So public data is another one. Uh, a lot of times when I'm doing this kind of stuff, I want to know what the intent is. There's always a trick, there's always a scam. So figuring, they, you know, I always ask what are they trying to get from you? Is it wireling money? Is it sending a data? Uh, the two hackbacks we're going to talk about, one was they wanted a document with sensitive data. The other one was to plant malware on our computer. And uh, we're going to reverse that on them and that's at the end of the talk. Final thing, uh, don't be afraid to question people. Uh, if somebody does start phishing you, ask who are you, how do I know you? It's not really that offensive unless like you're a mayor that like does it over and over to you and you're like, you don't remember me dude? We've been seeing each other like at work every week. You still don't know my name? Like other than that, that's like kind of awkward. Uh, typically questioning somebody who are you is okay. Um, phishing, just to be clear on the language, there are two types of phishing. Uh, there is the smash and grab, which is basically you don't know the target, you don't care about the target, you're just blasting out a bunch of emails, where spear phishing and your whaling is more targeted. So be aware of that. Uh, a lot of the phishing is typically not targeted, so you'll get the fake email that is going to everybody. That particular email, in most cases, you can copy and, and paste in Google and you'll find that the same email has been sent and people are complaining about it. So usually smash and grab is really easy to find via Google where the spear phishing and whaling is not because now they're actually going to your Facebook, your LinkedIn and creating a special present for you. So again, you know, ground zero, that's what phishing is in spear phishing. Now, uh, in general, I've given a bunch of examples but these would be basically some, ex uh, some technical examples. Beyond just the phishing email, a lot of times you have to know where it's coming from and this kind of gets down to the security stuff like DNS security, et cetera. A lot of times with spear phishing, people are going to buy a website that's kind of like yours or a source kind of like yours and that's how they're going to send the information because most people don't check that Google has two O's versus two zeros. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we know this example is like pretty stupid, right? It's, it's pretty obvious. That's, that's fine. Um, most attackers are going to be a little more creative and not make it that obvious. But the other thing I want to point out is you can actually have websites that look exactly like the source site because what, what was happening is uh, attackers were using ASCII characters or other character sets, different language character sets as well. So it actually confused the browser. So you did have something that looked like Google.com exactly like that. Now, luckily, most browsers browsers have fixed, right? I mean, uh, they kind of came up with updates like this year, I believe all of them did, and kind of fixed that. Yeah. All right, so for defenses, here's the legal defenses before we get into the illegal. This is your standard blocking stuff. So if you want to know what I can do about phishing 101, the first thing is going to be reputation security. What is that? That is credit scoring where you connect to. So if somebody says they're a bank, they've been online for two hours, they're, they're hosted from GoDaddy, 
Uh, they say they're a U.S. bank. They're really out of like North Korea. Obviously, it's not a bank. You drop it. Uh, most security vendors offer this. It's hard to read, but the website IHaveABadReputation.com. I challenge you all to go back to your company, go to IHaveABadReputation.com, and see what you see. If you see this like Pac-Man ghost guy, that means you don't have reputation security. That means anybody can set up a site right now and set a bunch of crap to you. If you do have reputation security, you'll get a block page. And what that means is it's not 100% foolproof, but what that means is at least people have to like have some credibility. So they could hack a church and then attack you. There could be a line for a while, but at least there's some credibility. So at your first layer, reputation security, DNS security can be doing that, or like Fortinet, Cisco, other vendors, you can get this with like the firewall technology. Second layer would be content filtering, which is basically reducing risky content. Because a lot of times your pornography and those sites will have the pop-ups and stuff, and those can also include ways to basically fish you. Uh, file integrity would be uh, uh, analyzing what comes from the sites, and then finally training. So this is your legal stuff. If I was to consult on phishing, these would be the initial things to talk about. Now, if these fail, then you need breach detection. And that's where Amir wanted to do a little bit on his side, since he does a lot on the research side, on building honeypots and some of the research he does, as well as how to catch when somebody uh, compromises your network. So go ahead. All right, so first of all, does anyone use the honeypot pots in their networks out here today? Anyone? Raise your hand. All right, we got a few people. So five people. Five people. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, first of all, you might want to turn up the volume when I speak for her ear must. <laughs> no, so uh, uh, for those of you that don't, don't know what a honeypot is, it's basically a fake system that lures an attacker. And the idea for that is to kind of pick up attack techniques. Um, you know, like we both use that and I use that like personally just in my research because I want to figure out what attackers are, are doing. What are the techniques they're doing? What, what are the kind of what, are, what is the malware that they're hosting? Um, exactly what are they interested in? Now there's two types of honeypots and most of the time if you Google honeypots or you see some of the more popular software, uh, you see low interaction honeypots and they're, they're cool. They give you like, you know, basic shit like, like S, earmuffs, earmuffs. <laughs> All right. Uh, they give you basic stuff like, uh, like SSH passwords, brute force, uh, basic things. But there's also high interaction honeypots. And for most high interaction honeypots, you're probably going to do a lot of uh, customization yourself. That's how you make the system look really real. And sometimes they are real systems. They're real WordPress sites, uh, you know, elastic search engines. They're real things. And you're just setting up enough defenses to log to figure out what, what it is. Now, before I even get started, like, I run a lot of honeypots on different VPS providers, different hosting providers, like, all over the world. And you have to kind of be careful, right? Because, like, first of all, I can tell you, I've had my own honeypots, like, compromised, and all of a sudden, you know, I may be researching, like, this new malware that's being spread, and I'm like, crap, I'm the command and control server, <laughs> like, my, my servers. Um, that's not a conversation you want to have with your boss, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, that's, and, and your boss is definitely not going to give you a high five and say, was that all the stuff you expensed out, so am I liable for that? <laughs> So just be careful. So a um, couple of things, just my personal best practices is uh, try and find honeypots or VPSs. I will give you two public addresses. And the reason I say that is because if you want to run a honeypot that's doing SSH honeypotting or web honeypotting and you need a management interface, you want two addresses out there. Now the other big thing is try to do no NAT. Now this is very, very difficult to achieve with uh, a lot of EPS providers because everyone does NAT. You may even look like you have a public address but it's being NAT at some place. The reason I say that is because you know, when you're running like you know, 20, 100, 200 honeypots and they're all coming back into a logging, like you're logging them all centrally and they all have the same IP addresses and you're usually like creating them on like templates, uh, it gets pretty crappy. You're like, okay, where the hell did this come from? And you're doing a lot more digging than you need to. Um, so just look at that. And then the other thing is don't tell your hosting provider what the hell you're doing because uh, they'll probably cancel your service and just always act dumb. They're like, hey, uh, were you hosting all this illegal software? Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Works out really well most of the time. Does anyone want to add to that? Oh, yeah. Um, there's, there's a term in the industry called resume generating events. Don't just go to YouTube and type in honeypot and get a 13 year old with acne that says, here's how to do a honeypot. 
Uh, we've had people with that in sandboxes, uh, basically our incident response team come out and figure out what actually happened. In a lot of cases, people will basically put a honeypot on the network and then malware gets on their network through the honeypot. And if you're responsible for the honeypot, that is a resume generating event. So please don't do that. Now with all best practices, like I mean we're, we're pretty much already standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean a lot of this is kind of best practice that's been out there, it's been documented and with our experience as well. But there's a lot of different types of honeypots and all these I'm showing are low interaction honey type of honeypots but they all run on different ports. Now I'll tell you like a lot of people think like okay well what do I need to have a honeypot? I need to get like this awesome server. No my, my servers are basically two gigs or a lot of times one gig of RAM, 20 gig hard drives. They're Pretty shitty boxes. Earmuff. She's in the bathroom. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm supposed to do earmuff before I cuss, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so just, uh, and then you can run multiple honeypots. So, like these ones that I have on port 80, they're all port 80. So, don't run all of them. You can pick one of them and then you can pick another one and pick another one. So, this you can kind of use as a map if you want. And there's a lot of different options out there. There's different things. These are just some of the common ones that, that I use. Now other, st other, other things I do with my honeypots is I actually just set up servers, uh, regular servers like FTP servers and uh, sometimes my FTP servers have like pretty easily guessable passwords, you know like, like admin and password <laughs> just to see what happens and I just set them up just to see like the, the, type, of, the type of stuff that I'm going to get. And uh, first of all I will tell you this is the best way to get free porn by far. <laughs> <laughs> Just set up an FTP server on the internet and you're good to go. <laughs> right. Now besides that, the coolest thing that I got was I actually got like every episode of Thundercats. And I don't know what happened but like someone actually, <laughs> yeah someone just logged into my honeypot and, uh, and I remember and I go man I set up an open FTP server and he's telling me like you did what? I go no no it's awesome I got every episode of Thundercats. <laughs> I don't know what people were doing and I did realize pretty fast because I, I was a fan of Thundercats when I was a kid. Man, I had this weird obsession with uh, Chitara, man. I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> so, all right, so, uh, so go ahead and do that. Uh, one of the other things that I do with my honeypots and this is, uh, this is, I've actually discovered zero days with this so that, uh, that I've done responsible disclosures but I actually have an XP machine that I have fully patched, so 100% patched and I do this with multiple operating systems as well, Windows 10 and Windows 8 and uh, so these are fully patched and I'm running non-admin mode so I'm not running as an admin user and then I have scripts that are just downloading a whole bunch of URLs. I'm getting them from virus total, uh, malware sites, open intelligence sites, uh, plus just a lot of uh, just other sources. I'm just downloading like you know hundreds of thousands of URLs through the system. And then what I do is I actually just compare the registry I, like at the end of each day has the registry changed. And if I find a change, right, that means that box is probably being compromised in some way. Now if I'm running a fully patched system and if I'm, uh, you, know, run, you know, running non-admin, most likely I've found a zero day. And that has happened to me before so that was, that was kind of cool. Now. Yeah, to be clear on that, that's, that's how a lot of researchers find zero days. You just basically create your honeypot, put the system up there, it's fully patched. If it gets popped, that's what you got there. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, let me just finish this up. Um, well, the other way, like we find a lot of zero days, is just oh shit, we found something. This is pretty cool, right? And who's the first one to publish this, right? That's a lot of times that's what happens as well. Uh, the last thing uh, that uh, uh, that, that I'll say is that I use PCAPs. I always capture PCAPs and we'll talk about this a little later on but the nice thing about this is sometimes it's just so hard to just capture all this traffic, analyze all this traffic. Yes with PCAPs I can actually run it against known signatures. I know signatures is an awful word but at least it gives me at least the type of attacks that are going on. So if I know I'm setting up something in the Ukraine and all of a sudden I see a whole bunch of you know VPN filter like as Cisco Talos discovered or uh, you know some other ransomware at least I can say hey this is happening in this region or something like that. I can analyze those PCAPs and just get a little uh, flexible later, later on. Um, pretty much what I, what I do and, uh, and I'll let Joey kind of uh, go into more details but there's a lot of logging tools. Um, one of the easiest ways to set up honeypots is to like use uh, Modern Honey Network for low interaction honeypots. They have like a built in logging interface. Um, I use Splunk or Elasticsearch and uh, you know when you have just good files, you know you set up a little bit of time, you can set up all your nice pretty graphs and make it look really nice and good as well. So again, this is all the breach detection stuff. We spent a little extra time on the honeypots. You want to learn more, check out our forensics book. Uh, Snort would be another one. So if your defenses fail, ideally you can have an IPS IDS. 
hopefully you all heard of Snort, but Snort you have to deploy, you have to tap and know where you're looking. If you want to have something where you don't really care where you're looking, then maybe a NetFlow would be another option. There's some security vendors out there that do this, Plixer, uh, Cisco, a few others that do the idea of uh, behavior and an analysis. Why do I see port scanning? Why do I see weird behavior? So those are your defenses. So that's, this is basically the end of the legal stuff. But basically if we were to say help me with phishing, we would set up the defenses, perimeter defenses, we would then look at breach. So if the perimeters fail, your honeypot or your IPS or your NetFlow tool would alarm. Now, what happens when you want to actually strike back? That's the big question. Well, technically speaking, it's not necessarily legal, as well as there's some things to think about. First off, think about what we just talked about. In a lot of cases, the attackers know there's reputation security, so they have to get around that. What are they going to do? They're going to hack a church, a school, something like that. So if you hack back, what are you hacking back at? You're hacking back at a church, school, or something. So don't necessarily see phishing and think, oh, I need to strike back right away. You may be hitting somebody who's basically a victim as well. And that's the first thing that we kind of discovered as we started researching this is we're not necessarily popping attackers' boxes, we're popping other boxes that have already been popped that are used as pivot points to attack people. So be aware of that. Second thing is there are interesting laws which we'll talk about here in a minute. And you need to be aware of what country you're in, or if you're traveling, what are the current laws of where you're at when you do this because, again, the laws are really iffy in this area of cyber, not to mention this idea of actually striking back. So everything from this point on, because again, of legal purposes, hi YouTube, is all in magic land. So this is hypothetically happened in, in a dream kind of thing and we'll show you a video that we pulled out of our dream as well. I'm sure that EFF is going to be wanting to talk to us. <laughs> We're here. Um, you know, you know. First of all, uh, even if you're authorized to hack back, and um, hopefully, me and him are going to do a talk about a, uh, something that happened interesting, where I, I was authorized by a DA to do hack back, and uh, and we did it, and we got the information, and we we caught someone that was like not a good guy, and uh, and he got off scot free because like you know I had to go to the judge and explain like what I did, and I was like, well, I hacked him, and you know, don't tell a judge you hack someone, even if uh, you got like uh, authorization and a warrant to do that. But, uh, mostly we failed because we didn't have a wiretapping uh, warrant that was uh, filled out wrong. So that, was, that really sucked. Um, but I will tell you there are laws that are changing and being proposed. Um, like the ACDC and, uh, and for those of you guys that don't follow Mal uh, the Malware Tech Vlog, great, great Twitter feed, uh, great site as well. But it's, it's pretty much, um, you know, no one has really thought about this law and just said, hey, hack back is going, going to be okay. It's, uh, it's a really, really uh, earmuffs. <laughs> okay, it's a really, it's a really shitty law that's out there. A really shitty proposal. It just takes into no account how like computer security really works or what's going on. Um, you know, today, unfortunately, most of the stuff kind of falls uh, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and things that shouldn't even fall there. In fact, uh, you know, at this conference, and we probably have known people that have been accused of breaking this law, um, it's not doing, it's being abused like any other law. So right now, hacking or hacking back is not a strategy. It's gonna get you in more trouble uh, than, uh, than anything else. Um, I guess unless you're hacking a country that we don't officially authorize as a country, right? <laughs> All right, so again, here's the strategy of most fishers. They're gonna basically, try to trick you in some form or fashion. A lot of times it's email or phone call. Uh, their goal is to get you to do something. In a lot of cases it's to install something or it's to have you provide some information and then once you are duped, they do something bad. So our strategy in Magic Land is, well what if we flip the script? Which means what if we basically then try to get them to do something and try to get them to basically be duped. So it's like almost reverse duping. So there's two stories to tell. The first story will actually be at the end, which will be the second story. And the reason why is we weren't recording the first time. And then after we like, made this happen, it was kind of awesome. We we're like, all right, let's actually prepare for this. And then the second time, we'll actually record something. So this is the second story uh, up first. And the idea here is, the, there was a fisher that was trying to get us to uh, fill out some Dell form. So the story is, this is Dell security support. Uh, I've seen this also with Microsoft security support, but they call you and they say, your computer is full of, of malware. And you're like, really? Holy shit, really? Uh, who are you? It's Microsoft. Well, I'm running a Mac. Well, yeah, well, that, that's okay too. It's like, <laughs> what? Uh, 
but it, it's, it's seriously, so with Dell it's the same thing, like we're running Macs and it's like, yeah, uh, we're a contractor and we're just seeing malware so we're supposed to basically come and, uh, and, and fix your box. What we found initially when we would just interact and not hack back, either they would A, want to get access to our box and then like show, oh look, we're inside your box but it, that's the bad guys inside your box. Pay us now like a annual service and we'll fix your computer. So we've had them try to sell us fake services which really you're selling services against them. Uh, we've seen it where they just ask for data or they've planted malware, like install this viewing tool and we can view your box. In the two stories, this story here, they try to get us to fill out a document. So the idea is, well, why don't we trick them and basically plant malware in that document and send it back and then when we open the document we pop their box. So that's the story we're going to tell now. And the other story, the idea was uh, we played stupid and said, well, hey, I'm trying to do what you're doing and this is frustrating me and like I've seen the, Ma the Matrix movie and the Black Hat movie, this should be easier. Uh, hey, I have this thing called WebEx, I can share my screen, why don't I share my screen and I'll give you full controls. So then I gave them the WebEx agent but I weaponized the WebEx agent so then I popped their box with the WebEx agent and then I, I, I took over their computer. So they, they had control of my sandbox while I had control of their computer. So those are the two stories. So what we'll do now is we're going to walk you through story one uh, which is the one we recorded which is the Dell story. So the story is um, basically you have to set up and this, we're going to walk you through the tools first but you need a sandbox because you want them to actually have something to, to have access to. Um, in this case, we got them to get the, the agreement letter. You need to weaponize it. We're going to talk about different weaponization, whether it's uh, droppers or, or rats, but you need to weaponize something and then trick them to either open that file, open that program, the exact same thing they're doing to us, making us like install things or click things, but just do it to them. So we'll go ahead and we'll walk through uh, the step by step. First part is building a sandbox. Cool. And, uh, you know, first of all, I would say don't. Uh, you know, you know, Cuckoo is complicated. Don't go to YouTube and like put like how do I install Cuckoo because it's, you're probably going to get a hacked, okay? Um, not, not saying there's not like a lot of good guides out there. Just be careful uh, because a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of sophisticated, um, you know, threat actors will look for uh, things like Cuckoo and of course everyone looks for VM tools. Um, no one's stupid enough to put VM tools. That's not what all attackers are looking for. Um, uh, you, you know, they'll look at like the certain DLLs like, uh, like the SBIE DLL and other things that, that it's kind of hard to get rid of uh, on uh, these boxes. Now when we're talking about sandboxes, we're not just talking about um, you know, something that you run and it, and it gives you a report. These are like kind of honeypot sandboxes as well. So they're full interaction sandboxes that we can stop, we can play, we can, uh, you know, uh, re, re image as well. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times that, uh, that I've seen like people put in sandboxes um, and they've just gone hack themselves, right? I mean, they just like compromise their entire network. So if you don't know what the hell you're doing, just buy a professional sandbox, right? That, that's easier. Um, one thing I just started playing around with a couple of weeks ago and a good friend of mine, um, I don't know if he's in the audience, Fred. Is there a Fred? Is anyone named Fred in the audience? Okay, you, you can be my friend. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, he told me about this tool called Clone uh, Clonezilla. Uh, it's uh, I mean, and actually using it. It's like super awesome for like just ghosting stuff and putting things in. So if you're like a malware author or doing any type of malware testing, uh, look at Clonezilla. It's actually like kind of saved my ass a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, honestly, I had a customer about a year and a half ago that built a sandbox and uh, they were playing with Locky ransomware and they got themselves infected with Locky. And when we did the investigation and we had to say, well, your sandbox is how you got infected. Resume generating event. So again, don't be that guy or girl. Um, when it comes to weaponization, there's two different options in most cases that you can use. One is establishing a full tunnel, which means you can interact, you can actually pivot from that box. And the other is a dropper, which to be clear, a dropper, you don't get full interaction. I talk to my dropper, give me this information and it comes back. So show me uh, uh, LS and a few minutes later I get back what, what's basically running in that folder kind of thing. So um, in this use case, we're looking at rats, which means we want full access to the person's computer. But no, there's different options like Empire, you can put droppers out there easily and be more stealthy. Where a rat, it's typically more chatty because it's a full tunnel. So it depends on what you're looking to do. In our case, you're going to find, uh, especially our first one was Amateur Hour. Um, there's a lot of things that we could have done better, but we did it anyways. So again, full tunnel or dropper are your two options. Um, you're going to find also in the second story that I talk about here is wrapping. And wrapping is the idea of actually taking a legit software and then wrapping it with malware. 
Uh, true story with the challenge, you guys know the packet capture village challenge? One of the challenges was finding a hash. That hash was uh, my so uh, sock book that some a-hole on the internet uh, wrapped with malware and literally we were in our sandbox, our Talos sandbox and I found, I was just trying to find hashes of, of malware I was like, holy crap, that hash is my book wrapped with malware. So you can wrap anything and like here's literally a, a, a freeware where I can take a book or take a software or, or a music file or uh, in this case the WebEx installation client and uh, wrap it with a backdoor. So literally you take like a, you can make a interpreter and Metasploit, you have that as your rootkit, you create your uh, whatever you want, in this case your WebEx, um, actually I don't, we're being recorded, uh, your <laughs> VPN client or, or shareware client recorded, you wrap that and if somebody runs it, boom, you're good. Now, the other thing though in this is obviously the uh, antivirus will catch it. You do want to do your, uh, <laughs> your modification to it, your encoding basically to make sure that it doesn't get detected. Uh, also by the way too, if you are going to do this, you probably want to have either like Trident or PEED, but you also going to want to have some kind of file detection piece and actually truly identify what the file is, especially when they send stuff to you. So in this use case, when they send us the Dell file, it actually did not have malware, but a lot of times a fisher is sending us something, usually it does have malware, and the way to see it is you put in a sandbox and you first analyze and make sure what it is. Because it may be a zip file or it may be some other file even though the file type is different. So not only should you build a sandbox, we highly recommend for you to download some freeware and actually identify what the file is before you start analyzing it. All right, so what, what, you know some of the things that we we started doing just to play around with, you know, how to get this malware on is we have to figure out that you know we don't want to really you know we both work for security companies we really know a little bit about how to bypass security devices and like everyone will tell you the way you bypass like security signatures and attacks is to use things that are already on the system right use PowerShell use Python Python is great you can like put a full wrap uh, Excel is a uh, is just a really easy wrap uh, that I came across that works on Mac machines as well and then from there. I mean, it's pretty much like Metasploit or uh, any of these tools. You can write your own own uh, rats and your own uh, uh, deployment pretty easily as well. And that's most of the time, like you know, when we're testing things, that's what we do. There's no signatures on something that I I write on the fly, right? Um, and also, you know, have a public server ready to go that's that's hosting stuff. I think a lot of times when we came across this research, and uh, you'll notice when we uh, when we talk about the video on exactly what we did is, um, you know, when when we got the call, you know, really I, I walked into the house and my mom's like, I don't understand this call. It's like someone saying Dell Tech Support, and, and you know, I'm, I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, all right, it's it's Christmas time. Christmas has come early, right? And I'm texting him. I go, dude, some guy's calling me, claiming he's Dell Tech Support, right? <laughs> And he's like, shit, he's like, what are we gonna do? And I was like, dude, I already got a Kali box set up in the cloud, like, uh, like we're gonna have some fun with this guy. So like, be, be ready to go. Um, you wanna talk about encoding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, as we mentioned in a lot of cases, what you don't wanna have happen is, same thing with them. If we're gonna hack back, we're gonna fish them, we don't wanna trick them, have them install the file and then like their antivirus blocks it. Like that's a complete fail. So um, make sure you encode. Basically what we did was we had our system already set up on the fly and then we were just basically trying out the files against the known security vendors and you're never going to get like 100% like bypass but as long as you get like a high enough number, in our case like 70% we're like this is good enough. This is like a Dell workshop. They probably have like a crappy computer anyways. So um, yeah, I mean pretty much make sure that you do test it before you send it. And then uh, finally uh, there was the location piece. You want to talk to this one? Yeah, so uh, you know, a couple of things that uh, when we we start talking about is we started playing around a lot with like macros, word macros, and if a word macro is actually not sending information back, it really doesn't trigger like uh, any AV type uh, you know triggers. So you can you put a macro in just to like basically record the IP address and like save that on like a hidden document or a hidden sheet, or uh, you know like start uh, start putting in like basic uh, uh, basic location tracking. So it was kind of cool. One of the things people always talk about is the attribution, but uh, you know when we're we were writing the local IP address and then like pinging your local gateway and doing a trace route which we can all do in a macro and uh, we'll, we'll have a little more detail on our sites on exactly how we accomplish that as well so you can see the code, it's just, uh, just v VB code. Um, uh, you know we know wh exactly what the attribution was and, uh, and, and I'll describe it a little bit but at the end of the video, I mean I saw the guy so I exactly knew exactly where he was from, it was, uh, it was a little obvious, at least, uh, at least I thought it was.
Anything you want to add? Basically, so. All right, so let me kind of set up this video just a little bit uh, before uh, we, we get going. As I, as I said, uh, you know, this really started off with like uh, me walking to my house. My mom's like, I don't understand what's going on here. Uh, and I talked to the guy, he's like, I'm Dell Tech support. I go, cool, I have a Mac, right? <laughs> or, 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 you know, BSD, or whatever. I mean, I fucking don't use a Dell. <laughs> and uh, well, he said he was a contractor. yeah, and, and then uh, you know, you know, then I'm just talking to him, and he's like, uh, you know, of course he's a contractor, and uh, he wants me to get on TeamViewer. He's like, oh, download TeamViewer, and I'm like, yeah, no way, man, <laughs> I'm not downloading TeamViewer. And he's like trying to scare me. He's like, well, first of all, you know, you have all this malware going on, and he's really putting it on, uh, like that. He's like, you're gonna get arrested because you, you know, you may not know what you're doing, but now you're responsible for this malware, and you're destroying people's lives, and and democracy depends on this, man. Like, pay me, right? And I'm like. All right, what do I do? I don't understand. And I was getting him really frustrated. You know, I was, uh, yeah, you know, I was, uh, you know, pretending like I didn't know much. And he's like, "All right, you know what? Here's a document, and send me this document." I'm like, "It's Christmas, man. It's beautiful." <laughs> I go, "You're sending me a document." So of course he sends me a document. Put it in the sandbox. I was like so excited at this point. I'm not even just like running this. I'm like, "Fuck it! I'll, I'll, I'll re-image my box." This is <laughs> like. And that's how I always get infected, you know. Like you know, you know, you start off like 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 that's oh, fine. I don't need to put in my VM and uh, the, document was the document was clean. It was it was completely clean, right? Um, so um, so I did the most basic thing. I set up the, the most basic encoder in MS Venom. And why doesn't every AV just freaking catch this? This is you know script kitty stuff, right? That's all we're doing is I'm setting up a, a local uh, you know a local exploit. And uh, this is a payload um, and uh, and and. Uh, and the macro that I, we put in. Now, um, for, you're not you're not going to put in the payload like uh, like visible in the document. You'll see that I just have it like in the document here. Um, at the very least, just make it white. Just like let him make the color of the font white. They're not they're not going to see it, but you can put it on a transparent sheet. There's uh, there's other things you can do as well. And yeah, you know he's going to like depending on the version of uh, Word he has, he's going to get some error out here. It doesn't matter. I mean, as security people, we always say like no one's going to click on a macro. Everyone clicks on it. They click on something. Even if he clicks end, it doesn't matter. And that's why I got the, the shell code here anyway. So it's going to bypass a lot of stuff anyways. It's going to run automatically. So, uh, so I save it. Of course, I told him my name. He wanted to know my name. My name is Ethan Hunt. So that's what I told him. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's good. That's good. You know, that's great. Uh, so, uh, so of course, I'm waiting for him to like open the document. I'm waiting and I'm texting the like, Joe, Joey. Joey, he's going to open it. He's going to open it. And uh, and of course, like like it takes takes him like five minutes to open it, and uh, finally, bingo, right? I mean, I I get my uh, my reverse shell um, back. Now, what's funny is I actually didn't put anything in it. So he called me up. He's like, the document's empty. He's like, did you did you not know what you were doing? Like like uh, what's go what's going on? You just said you sent the wrong document. Yeah. Call me. Yeah. Like just the wrong document. You're yeah. excited. Yeah. In fact, you can see like I'm like so excited because I'm like like what can I do here? What can I do here? Right? I mean, I, I even put in the wrong commands here, and uh, and uh, and so uh, once once he opened up the document, I could I could see his uh, I could see his desktop running. He's still staring at the empty document. Um, <laughs> I'll be, it's going to be there. The information is going to like, like, and that, this is the actual document that he sent, sent right? Uh, so you, you, you can see that, uh, that he didn't write it. Now, um, at that point, I, like, what I ended up doing was uh, just like turning on, first of all, like snapshots, like on the webcam. So, so that way the light wouldn't go on on the, on the webcam. And, um, and so just to see how he looked like. But at the end, I was like, F it. Let's just turn on the webcam, right? <laughs> <laughs> And so this is the part, like uh, you know, we were kind of a little afraid of, just because there was a lot of there was a lot of people here. It wasn't just one guy. I mean, there was uh, there was like two or three people next to him. Um, there was uh, you know there was uh, people behind it. It was it was a call center type uh, type uh, thing. And so uh, that's why I didn't uh, put that on there. And then I'm talking to him. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a really nice red shirt. And uh, you know, like uh, you know, your 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 turban's a little messed up here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you what country I think it attributed from. <laughs> Uh, right, but uh, uh, so like he's like, what? He's like not understanding me, and I was like, you know, at that point I go, hey, bro. So I start talking to him in Hindi right now, <laughs> and, and I go tell him exactly. I go, uh, you know, I go, yeah, this is really nice, and these are the files. Oh, you got. He had WeChat. He had AIM. We, uh, I think we have a we have a picture of his desktop we took, uh, but we he had a we. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
but uh, but but you know every chat message uh, like uh, like uh, known to the world. So the video that I actually had um, that hopefully we'll be able to put up is basically him running towards the camera and pulling it out before it freezes. Uh, so uh, so uh, that was uh, that was awesome. And of course, this is all hypothetical. I'm pretty sure a wink is a defensible, uh, uh, you know, plea. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> so yeah, again, we can't, we couldn't show that because the language on the desktop and uh, the country of origin, all this stuff, our HR departments like don't show it. But we hope to show it because again, it's magic land. But we have to help to show this dream scenario that really didn't happen or did happen on our blogs at some point in the near future. That's scenario two. Scenario one was the other one, just to mention. So I, this one we didn't have a recording. This is like when we started actually first hacking back. But this was my scenario where, again, I had somebody call me. They were trying to tell me that I have malware on my computer. So they're trying to walk me through commands to install stuff. So all I was doing was just acting really slow and saying, I don't get it, or I'm fat fingering it, and, like, and just kept saying, I don't get it. And that's when I offered, well, I have this shareware software made by a, uh, a I guess I can't use the word web app. Oh, that's good. WebEx, um, and basically said, I, I can share my screen and I can let you interact. So I'll give you full control and you can do it for me. And I can hear in his voice the excitement because he thinks he's won. He's like, I'm going to full control this guy's computer. This is awesome. So I'm like, sure, just run this app. So I, I send him a link, exact same trick he did to me, but I basically weaponized my WebEx and popped his box that way. And same thing, we started interacting with his computer and uh, turned on his camera. I basically just screwed with his computer to the point where his computer started acting funny and then he got freaked out and then killed the connection. So again, same idea. So the whole point of this here to summarize what we've did is really if you think about it, phishing in general is the idea of, tri of tricking people. They're trying to trick you, they're trying to make you do something. Uh, we talked about today first the, the legal defenses. So hopefully again, I have a badreputation.com. Try that website out. Think about reputation security, think about content filtering, firewalls, that kind of stuff. And then have breach. If you don't have breach, you're an idiot. Because how do you know if those defenses are working or not? If you're not validating those, you don't know if something's getting through. We talked about honeypots today, which you can learn more on our book. We talked about uh, IPS and NetFlow as legitimate tools. But if you do want to hack back, we did talk about how to build a sandbox. You want to do this obviously on the net. We talked about some of the legalities of it. We talked about if you do hack back, you're probably, you, I mean, we got lucky in these two cases. Some of the other cases when we do actually pop a box, we find we're in a school or a church or some other system, meaning it's a pivot point. So you don't necessarily are going to like hack back and always get the bad or guy or girl. You may get some, some pivot points. But if you do get lucky enough like we got where you're actually talking to the person on the phone, in a lot of cases now you're actually talking to the victim or the, uh, the attacker so they can become the victim, which basically is what we talked about, which is think about tricking them using the exact same tactics. You can use rats, you can use droppers, however you want to do it. There's many ways of doing it. We showed two. And then the idea is if you do, you know, get them back, post it somewhere and, uh, and embarrass them because hopefully they'll stop doing it. Yeah, the one thing I would uh, like to add is once, if this ever happens to you and you start laughing uncontrollably at them, <laughs> hit the mute button because it does make them a little suspicious, but uh, uh, <laughs> you, you can also just tell them you're crying because you're so scared or something like that. That worked too. <laughs> <laughs> So again, we do appreciate it. We hope to publish more information about this as we continue to do this in Magic Land. Uh, and if you guys end up doing some of this as well, uh, again, I'm, I'm Joseph Muniz. This is the mayor. Reach out. Let us know. We'd love to hear about your uh, fishing back or attack back adventures. Thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of the platform. <laughs> <laughs>